to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ christians must contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Jude, verse number three. We welcome you today to our study of the book of Jude. Jude is an aggressive, militant approach to standing up for the truth of God's Word that He's given us. And friend, we need that in a world that is so liberal in its thinking, in a world that has gone so, so far away from the Bible, Christians need to be reminded we've got to stand up and be counted for as God's people. And so we're so glad that you joined us today for our study of the book of Jude. Hope you get your Bible. If you don't have it, have it ready as we're going to be looking in the Word of God today as our authority. As always, we're so glad you've joined us. We want you to know that you're our honored guest on this program. We hope that you'll stop by and visit the Lord's Church, the Church of Christ in your area, uh, whether it be on Sunday night or Sunday morning or Wednesday night. There'll be people there who love God, who are concerned about the truth, and more than anything, who want to help people go to heaven. And so visit the Church of Christ in your area. Here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also like to help you in your study of God's Word. Please visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a wide variety of good Bible study material there. We have book lessons on every book in the Old and New Testament and a wide variety of topical studies as well, available in video and audio form, transcript, written form, with study questions also. You can access all of that from our website free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson as a digital download or on a DVD or CD, you can write to us, call us, or fill out our media request form, and we'll make that available to you free of charge. We'll even cover the postage to get that there. And don't forget about in our app store, both for Android and Apple phones, we have an app that's available. Great way to study in our fast-paced world today. Let's direct our attention for a few moments today to the message of Jude as he encourages Christians in the first century to stand up and diligently fight for the faith. That's the whole message that Jude is trying to get across. Notice Jude verse 3, Christians must contend for the faith. Look in verse number 3 with me. Jude says, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Nobody really, most people don't like conflict. Most people don't like fighting. Most people don't want to be put in a position where they have to do that. Most of the time we try to avoid that. But when it comes to God's truth, from time to time, Christians are called upon to stand up and fight for that truth. We're to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, we're to expose them. On numerous occasions in Jesus' ministry, He had to stand up to the religious leaders of His day and He would say things like, You do therefore greatly err, not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. Mark chapter 12 and other places as well. But why is it? When we think about this idea, why is it that we must contend for the faith? Notice verse 3 and 4 again. We've got to contend earnestly for the faith, don't miss this, which was once for all delivered to the saints. How much more revelation is God sending? How many more Bibles are we going to get? How many more letters are there going to be? Friend, listen to these words. Why must we contend for the faith? It was once for all delivered to the saints. What's that mean? This, the Bible, is God's final will and revelation. Holy men of God spoke as they were guided by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter 1, verses 19 through 20. We have everything we need 
for life and godliness through his knowledge. 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 3 and 4. And so there's not going to be any more anything new. This is it. This is God's revealed will and message for us. And friend, that's important. That's powerful. It saves men's souls. James 1 verse 22. Knowing the truth sets you free from sin. And if this is God's final revealed message, we need to stand up against and fight for it because it's so important in the Christian life. Think about the words for just a moment with me. Contend earnestly is a really big compound Greek word and it means to do vigorous battle. Picture this in your mind. It is like two gladiators going at it on the battlefield. It's like two MMA fighters in a caged arena duking it out. It's kind of the idea that we've got to aggressively, actively fight for the faith. Am I saying that we're going to go out and beat people up? That's not the idea. I'm going to take a two by four and hit it over somebody's head because they're teaching. That's not the idea there. What are we saying? I want to stand up for the truth with the truth. Is there a right way to do that? Sure. I want to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4.15, but I also want to speak the truth. Speaking the truth, saying that's not true because the Bible says this. We've got to do that at times. Uh, you're not somebody's enemy when you tell them the truth, Galatians 4.16. The truth has to be spoken even when people teach things that are not right about that. And so part of the problem here is there are people in the time that Jude is writing who are false teachers who are teaching and living things contrary to the doctrine of Christ. And we're going to notice what that is right now. Look in verse number 4. Jude says in verse 4 about these people, why is there such a need to contend for the faith? Here it is. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men. What are they doing? Who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Not only are these people teaching something that's wrong, they're denying God and they're denying Christ. Maybe they're teaching He's not the Son of God. They're denying who He is with their words, but notice also with their action. They turn, listen to this, they turn the grace of God into lewdness. Lewdness is a, a pretty dirty word. It describes immoral, sensual, ungodly actions. We read about some of those in the letter to the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, where Jezebel is teaching some of those people to commit acts of fornication and sexual immorality, and they're not taking care of her like they ought to. It's hard to imagine that somebody would be doing that. But they're taking God's grace, and they're turning it into a license to sin. Romans 6 verse 1, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Evidently, some answered that question with a yes. Since God's grace was given for sin, we can continue in sin, and the more we sin, the more grace we're going to get. Paul says, God forbid, absolutely not that's the idea. That's not the idea. But some are trying to take God's saving grace. The gift of Jesus, the love of God, the willingness to wipe away man's sin, and they were saying, since we have that grace, and since we can be forgiven, it won't hurt if we go out and do these things. And John Jude says, you've got to stand up to that teaching. You've got to tell people that's wrong, that lifestyle's wrong, and there are things about it that are going to be damning to people's soul. And so Jude reminds them that from the Old Testament, this isn't the first time. Things like this have happened, and he's going to show them from the Old Testament that a person can fall from God's grace and start teaching and living in a way that's not acceptable. Let's look at those examples together. Look in Jude verses 5 through 7. He's going to remind them about this, about those who were like this before. He says, But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved an everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of that great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance 
of eternal life. Can a person who is a child of God get caught up in sin and, and wrong ideas and, and suffer the consequences? Jude says, absolutely. Let me show you. I want you to think about the Israelites. The Israelite people. You know, God did a lot to save them, right? The ten plagues, bringing them across the Red Sea on dry land, sending the great leader Moses, taking them all the way to Mount Sinai and toward the Promised Land. But what happened to those people whose feet touched the dry land uh, as they crossed the Red Sea? What happened to the most of those people? Dropped dead in the wilderness. They died. Because of what they did, they began to complain, they began to murmur, they wouldn't trust God, and they, they got involved, and the Bible says they didn't believe. It wasn't that, you know, that word believe doesn't mean that they didn't believe in God. They'd seen the miracles. They knew God existed, but they weren't living that out in their life. They quit living like God wanted them to live. Think about the next example. The angels who did not keep their proper domain. He's reserved in chains of, of darkness for everlasting judgment and eternal fire. Second Peter will mention that example as well. What about these angels? Some evidently broke again, uh, went, out again, went away from God. Some did not obey God's authority. And as a result, they're being held until the judgment day to be dealt with. Think about this. If the Israelites that God saved out of Egypt, if the angels who, who were in His presence, Sodom and Gomorrah, if, if what happened to that city, God rained down hail and brimstone upon it and burned it up. All those people who were one time God's children, who were walking right, who were with God, they stopped living, they stopped teaching right, they turned the grace of God into lewdness. What happened to them? They suffered the consequences of that. And so, friend, the message for us is we've got to make sure we contend for the faith. It's all that we have. And we want to make sure that we live in such a way that God's Word is shining forth in our life. Now, Jude is going to give some examples who are like these false teachers to remind them what these people who are taking God's grace and turning it into immorality and lewdness are like. Don't these false teachers remind you of someone, Jude says? Look beginning in verse number 11 with me. Jude says this, Woe to them, to these false teachers. They've gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and have perished in the rebellion of Korah. What are these false teachers like? Don't you remember people like that in the Bible? What about Cain? Cain and Abel, all the way back to Genesis 4. God evidently had a right and a wrong way, according to 1 John 3. Abel did what was, what was right, Cain did not. He got jealous. His jealousy motivated him to murder. He killed his brother. He was marked as a murderer the rest of his life. He did things that were not right, even though he knew there was a right way. It was defiance to the will of God. What about Balaam? Balaam wanted to curse God's people so bad. He was doing it for money. Uh, at one point, Balaam makes one of the great statements in the Bible. Numbers 21, Balaam says, I'm not going to turn from the right hand or to the left. I'm going to say and do what God says. Ten chapters later, he dies in battle against the people of God. Why? He wanted that money. It was all about another motive to him. The lust of the flesh, the passion, desire. Cain was motivated by defiance of God. Balaam was motivated by money. What about those in the rebellion of Korah? Power. They said to Moses and they said to Aaron, why has God given you so much power? We want some also. We're going to take it for ourselves." And the ground opened up and swallowed thousands of people because of that. Think about these things. Rebellion and selfishness. Greed, power. That's what those people were motivated by in the Old Testament. And Jude is saying... That's the motive of these false teachers. They're not in it to save your soul. They're in it because they want the power. They're power hungry. They want the money. They want to act in these ways. And they don't want to do what God wants them to do. They want to live in defiance of that. Well, what about all these great claims that these false teachers are making? Notice what Jude says they're like in verses 12 and 13. Jude says, Of these false teachers and their claims, these are spots 
in your love feast. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees with fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. What, what are all these examples about? Friend, they make great claims. You do this, it'll help you to be a better person. You do what we say, it's going to help you to be more spiritual. These things aren't really bad, they'll improve your life. Wait a minute now. What are they like? They're like that fruit tree that says it's time to come get an apple when it's only lying. They're like that cloud needing the rain bad. And you see that cloud coming and it doesn't drop a drop of water. They're like spots in your love feast. Uh, you know, it's, and the, the, some of the wording is it's like rocks in your love feast. Think about this with me. What's it like? What are false teachers like? You remember, I remember when my grandmother would get a, ready to make a pot of beans and I remember she'd laid all those beans out on the counter. She'd sift through those beans because every now and then they'd get a little rock in there. And one time she missed one and I bit down on that rock thinking it was a bean. How well do you think that felt? That's the exact point. It ought not to be there it's not nourishing, it's not helpful, it's making promises it will never deliver on. It, <clears throat> they're not going to help you spiritually. But know this, Jude clearly says, their judgment's coming. They're not going to get away with this and don't be sided with them when that judgment comes. Look in verses 14 and 15. Jude says this, he gives this example. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of His saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all, listen to these words, who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they've committed in an ungodly way and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against them. Is there a day coming when these people are going to get their just due? Absolutely. God's going to judge these people. But did you hear that word that's mentioned four times? In those two verses, these people are ungodly. Their motive is not to promote God, promote spirituality, to help people grow as a Christian. They're focused on the ungodly. And yes, there's a judgment day coming when all men are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans chapter 14, verse number 12. It's appointed a man wants to die. And then the judgment. John 5, verse 28 and 29, all who are in the grave will one day come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And friend, that judgment day, the standard is going to be crystal clear. Revelation 20, verses 12 through 15, John says, I saw, he, he sees this great picture. He, there's a throne of God. I see the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books are opened. And another book is open, which is the book of life. And the dead are judged according to things written therein. Friend, there's a standard of the Word of God. My life is also going to be judged by that standard. If I'm a Christian, I'm trying to walk in the light. Friend, we're not saying you've got to be perfect. But if you're out living an ungodly life, teaching things that are not right for your own selfish gain and promotion, won't that be a sad day to hear the Lord say, Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Matthew chapter 25. And you know, really, Jude says, these false teachers, it's not hard to figure them out. Their nature's pretty evident. Look in verse number 16. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lust. They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Not hard to figure out the false teacher in their, their nature, is it? Complainers, grumblers, mouthing great swelling things. Why? To take advantage of you. It's not about you. It's about them. It's not about helping you to grow closer to God. Sometimes it's about lining their pockets. How many times have you seen that in your lifetime? Some religious leader, some televangelist, somebody says, God wants you to send in a million dollars and we're going to do such and such with it. And lo and behold, they were pocketing it. And, of course, they got found out about that. Well, same thing here. Complainers, grumblers, never content, never happy, don't trust God, trying to just use big words and things to uh, draw people away from the truth. 
It's not hard to spot a person like that most of the time, especially when you're letting the Bible be the guide. Well, what can we do then? In view of these false teachers, in view of what their judgment is coming, how does a Christian deal with that? How do I remain faithful and persevere when there are people like this doing things that are not right? Well, first of all, I've got to remember this is nothing new. The Lord told us these people were coming, right? Look in verse 17 and 18. Jude says, But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lust. The Lord said there would be wolves in sheep's clothing. Matthew chapter 7. His followers taught us there would be people coming who, who aren't true according to the Word of God. We're to mark them and we're to note them. And so it ought not to shock us. When this happens, sometimes it, we think, well, why did they do that? They were supposed to be. The Lord said there were going to be people like that. Not everybody is in it with good motives. I need to realize some people are just shysters or con artists, and they're in it for the wrong reason. And so don't let that shock you to the core. The Lord and His apostles warned us this would happen. And then remember the true nature of these false teachers. What are they really like? Look in verse 19. The Bible says, These are sensual persons, and, and sensual means... Uh, Worldly. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. What are these people really like? To overcome this, I've got to realize they're all about the flesh. They're all about fulfilling the lust of the flesh. They want to know where their next fleshly high is coming from. They're all about the body and the sensual, worldly aspect of it. They're not concerned about the spiritual. Well, what can I do then? Paul says you've got to grow in faith and you've got to remember to pray, and you've got to keep yourself in the love of God. Look in verse, or Jude says, look in verses 20 and 21. Jude says, but you, beloved, here's what you can do, beloved. Build yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keeping yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Friend, when everything seems to be going awry, when people are teaching and doing things that are not right, what can I do? I need to remember, hey, you've got to grow in your faith. Uh, I've got to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior. 2 Peter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter 2, verse, verse 2, I've got to be like that newborn babe, and I've got to desire the pure milk of the Word, that I may grow thereby. I don't ever want to think I've reached a point that this is where I need to be spiritually. Continue to grow. Pray, Jude will say. You know, when you think about troubling times, we often find people in great prayer. Jesus prayed in the garden, Matthew chapter 26. Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, great men of God, when they were put in difficult spots, they turned to God in prayer. When we find ourselves having to contend for the faith, and we will, we need to remember to be a people of prayer. Not only do I want to grow in the faith, I want to be a person of prayer. Pray. If the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man overcomes much. James chapter 5, verse 16. I want to stay focused on God's love and salvation. Keep yourself, Jude says, in the love of God. Don't, don't get dragged down in the muck and mire. Don't let the dirtiness of it taint you. Stay focused. Even in defending the faith, stay focused on God's love. Why are we standing up for truth? Why are we opposing error? Why are we teaching these things are not right? Because we love God and we love others and we don't want anybody to lose their soul. Focus on God's mercy and God's salvation. Friend, God's been so merciful to me and you. And if we can help these people to see the truth and come out of that, God will be merciful to them also. And they don't have to lose their salvation. They can be saved and live a life of change that true to God, and that is right in His sight. And then, of course, we try to save them in the proper way. There's always a right and a wrong way to do things. Even in contending for the faith, you want to have the proper approach. What is that approach? Look in verses 22 and 23. 
Jude says, On some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by flesh. Sometimes we have to be a good judge of, of human nature and we have to look for people that we can save with compassion. Some people who maybe are caught up in this need to be reminded of the love and compassion of God and, and they need to see that and, and be pointed toward that. Others, it may take fear. It may take hellfire and brimstone to save some people. But we've got to be wise enough. Jesus taught us to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves. How are we going to reach people? Different modes may work, but we've got to look at the person and try to figure that out. And then finally, Jude says, and all of this, let's keep praising God. Look in verse 24 and 25. Jude says, Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Don't lose sight of what really matters. Praise God. Live a life that brings Him honor and glory. Don't forget your purpose in life is to glorify God. Isaiah 43, verse number 7, and in everything we do, we we'll want to give Him the glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, whether we eat or whether we drink or whatever we do, we do all to the glory of God. You know, sometimes if we're not careful, we can get caught up in the contending for the faith and we can forget what it's all about. We're doing this because we want to praise God. His truth, not ours, is what matters. His Word, not ours, is what's going to save people. God, His grace, His mercy, and His love must not be taught wrong. It's got to be taught right. And, and, and defending the faith is all about praising and honoring God. And so today, if you're not a Christian, as always, we invite you to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you believe He's the Son of God? John chapter 8, verse 24. Would you turn from a life of sin and turn in repentance to God? Luke 13, verse 3. Would you confess, just like the Ethiopian eunuch, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And friend, as the Bible says, to have our sins washed away, would you be baptized in water for the remission of your sins? Acts 2, verse 38. And then, rising up out of that to live a new life, that brings honor and glory to God. If you haven't done that, we encourage you to do so. If we can help you with that, please let us know and join us next time as we study more about God's Word. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.